And we got a small group now, but I know some people are going to join us after they get out of other classes and other things uh, in a little bit. But uh, I think everybody knows me. I'm Sue Glenn, and this is our world classroom. And these have all been uh, STEM related up until today. We are expanding it to make it STEAM related. So we are putting the A into STEM and uh, making a, a, a an attempt to sort of pull in the arts. So I know that our two, we have two guests today who uh, agreed to do this jointly. And, uh, and so I think they want to introduce themselves. So I'm gonna let them take it away and, uh, and I will step in if you need me to. Um, hi, I am Aglenko and this is Lillian. Before we started, we wanted to do a, a land acknowledgement, which is, um, we recognize that the land on which our host RCSJ stands and where each of us is streaming from is occupied unceded Lenni Lenape territory. We honor the Lenape and other indigenous caretakers of these lands and waters, the elders who lived here before and the indigenous people today and the generations to come. Um, and if you haven't heard a land acknowledgement before, they're really common in um, Canada, New Zealand and Australia. Um, and it's kind of the bare minimum you can do. Um, but Lily, you can introduce yourself properly. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lillian Melcher, um, and I'm a comics artist who uh, has found herself uh, doing uh, nonfiction, uh, visual nonfiction, uh, which is part new media, also part very old media, but I'll get into that later. <laughs> Oh, okay. And I am I'm a Glencoe. I do, um, I'm a multimedia artist who works in comics and gallery installation using textiles and printmaking. Um, I predominantly do fiction work uh, that I would describe as like forgery, um, which we'll get into when it is my turn to talk, but I believe Lily is going to do her presentation first. Yes, I will start that now, um, if that's all right. Yep, you should be able to share your screen. Great, going for it. And we'll let you know if things get stuck. Excellent. I'm opening PowerPoint, apparently. Can everyone see that? I can. Cool. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so yes, uh, in <clears throat> just a moment. Oh no. There we go. Okay. All right. So, uh, yeah. Uh, in 2019, I came out with my first book, uh, The Adventures of Alexander von Humboldt, um, which is a biography of um, the naturalist and polymath uh, Alexander von Humboldt from the years uh, 1799 until 1804, which is the period of time when he was uh, in South America uh, collecting data um, that would he would basically be parsing through for the rest of his life. Um, this data, of course, was the basis for what we now use um, as our data points for understanding how climates have changed over time. Um, and uh, it was a really interesting project because it, um, like if you're looking for my book in Barnes and Noble or where have you, um, it's not going to be in the graphic novel section usually. Uh, it's usually in the um, nature section or earth sciences section. Um, and this is a marketing nightmare, but it is very cool um, for sort of the uh, future of what comics are kind of becoming. And um, it, it, it's just a really interesting little niche um, I found myself in because this book is part biography, part, um, you know, just overall kind of scientific history and um, also part sort of explainer on um, some really interesting concepts having to do with climate change. Um, so my like story sort of started uh, when I went to Parsons uh, School of Design in New York. Um, I started in 2012. I graduated in 2016. Um, my time there was, uh, I, I was in the illustration program and over time I 
uh, found that I was really interested in children's literature, um, but I was always very interested in the theory behind it um, and what you could sort of teach through um, a children's book and what we kind of learn by reading um, the way that we do read children's books. Um, and so this sort of led me to what were the original children's stories? Um, and I found Aesop's Fables. I thought that was really cool. So I did this whole project on Aesop's Fables and how um, they are moral teachings without a religious background. And I thought that was really awesome. Um, and through that work, um, I won a number of awards and I, uh, my professors, um, especially Lauren Redness, who is a really amazing, um, uh, I mean, she also does graphic nonfiction. Um, she does these like long form um, sort of, uh, it's like journalism, I would, I would say it's closest to, I'll, I'll show you some in a minute. But um, so Lauren Redness uh, saw my work and when she, was unable to do a project, which was the Humboldt book, uh, she asked me to kind of put my hat in the ring. Um, there I met Andrea Wolf, who was the uh, author of The Invention of Nature. Um, and she had decided that she wanted to do a graphic novel uh, to tell the story in depth of the years that Humboldt was in South America because she didn't really touch on that in The Invention of Nature as much as she wanted to. And um, honestly, her fans were sort of upset. So she wanted to give it a special look. And um, because Humboldt was so specifically an artist and a scientist, um, his journals are totally filled with these drawings. Um, you can see here, there's a seal and a penguin. Those are drawings that Humboldt drew. Um, and then you can see a little bit of what I do is I tried to put Humboldt in the scenery where he was doing these drawings. Um, so this is a, a great example of what we really want to do with this project. Um, we have all of this evidence of how Humboldt was looking at the subjects he was studying through the art. Um, and we wanted to really emphasize that he wanted to present his findings uh, to a broad audience and get um, as many people as possible to be passionate about um, the natural world. That was really his goal with a lot of his writing. It was popular science. Um, so uh, in order to create this world, um, to tell the story of Humboldt, um, I wanted to create a visual language that would have been uh, familiar to Humboldt and people living in Humboldt's time. Um, so I started to look at uh, what were comics in the time of Humboldt. Uh, and you can see these political comic, comics um, from that time. They were either this format, which is very classically comics, there's text and an image and they're pretty small and paneled, um, or um, more popularly, there were these um, illustrations that were a single image with, um, with text uh, and I thought that these were really interesting. They had the speech bubbles. They solved all the problems that I had um, when trying to uh, put this story in comics, but also back in time. Um, if I could use these visual cues within this existing media, then I could kind of trick your brain into uh, like knowing where in time this story took place. Um, so to further uh, mimic this look, I uh, had to figure out, you know, how are these images made? So they're etchings that are then colored with um, ink or watercolor. The etching is made with an oil-based ink and the color is a water-based ink. So when you paint over the black line, uh, the black line will come through because the oil and the water um, resist. Uh, so I would draw the image in pencil 
And then I would scan that into my computer, kind of bump up the color a little bit to make it blacker and bolder. And then I would print it at Staples. And the industrial printers at Staples have toner um, that is oil-based. Uh, and this is very common in like office printers, industrial printers. I can't replicate it on a home printer, I've tried. Um, and the and I can just watercolor over the uh, staples print and it creates the same resist, um, but I don't have to etch every plate and, um, you know, print everything. <laughs> Um, so when incorporating text, because again, this was a collaboration between me and Andrea Wolf. Andrea Wolf wrote everything and I drew and collaged everything. Um, I wanted to make sure that when you were reading it, um, big blocks of text had uh, sort of a deliberate place within the book. So um, as much as I could, I tried to uh, incorporate the text into the image. For example, um, the shape of the text here is saying as much as the image. Uh, this is an image of talking about a subterraneous um, drainage of this lake. And so the text describing that drainage is actually coming out of, draining out of the lake. Um, here I'm describing keystone species. So the text, um, making up the arch is describing um, what a keystone species is in nature, while the uh, image describes what a keystone is in architecture. Um, and then here I uh, incorporated the, um, the text about quinine and creating medicine out of the quinine tree into the actual specimen of quinine that Humboldt um, collected um, when he was in South America. Um, so yes, we have all of Humboldt's original writings from this trip. Um, we have all of his notes, all of his drawings, and all of his plant specimens. And it was very important to me as I worked on this project um, and I talked to more and more scientists uh, for example, uh, my first experience was talking to the botanists at the Botanical Garden in New York. Um, they sent me home with a whole bunch of leaves to study and print with and try to, you know, recreate some of Humboldt's um, methods. Um, so it became very important to me that, you know, all of this material exists and people who study Humboldt are very familiar with it. So creating this look of the layers and how he thought and how he interacted with his um, materials was really important. Um, so I started to create these collages. Um, this was also a great way to incorporate the actual documents. Um, we got permission to use them from a, mu a museum, a library in Berlin. Uh, these are reproductions, of course. Um, so I print them at Staples. I would rip the edges a little bit and uh, tea dye them, which is what everyone did for their middle school homework, um, but it works here. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I, I am big on tea dyeing. Uh, and it would create a um, overall look like this. So these are the actual specimens I got from the uh, New York Botanical Garden. These are all um, plants that exist in um, the we have the exact notes on what plants he was seeing at what time. Um, so on these pages are notes about these plants. Um, and he has specimens of these plants that he collected while he was writing these notes. Um, and then we have the scene of him at this specific part of his journey, walking on top of the exact notes that he took with the plants around him. That's the type of, um, like complete immersion that Humboldt allowed me to create because he was so meticulous with his notes and so meticulous with collecting everything around him. Um, so yeah, uh, these are those specimens that I photographed and I made some prints with, but in the end, we ended up actually getting the rights to use his um, original specimens, which was amazing because in the scene, here is Bonplant drying out his specimens in a, um, in a, a, a clay oven. And um, 
and then here are the actual specimens that he did that to. It's the exact same ones. Um, this was actually interesting. Uh, he lost some pages and they were lost to mold. So I had to create mold. And so I went to my mother's shed and I covered some of the pages with um, gross stuff from my fridge. And I actually made mold, which was very cool. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, and um, so that was a little bit about the creation of the images. Um, the text itself uh, would come to me like this. This is what I worked off of. Um, this would come from Andrea and then we would take a bunch of notes together. Um, most of this planning happened um, one week in New York. We just, we, we were able to have a table in the back of an office and we sat there and we went through every single page and we thumbnailed. And this is what my thumbnails look like. Um, you know, a lot of people think that everything has to be very polished when you're developing something like a book, but um, sometimes it's better to just get the idea out. Um, and that's what I tell myself when I look at my thumbnails. <laughs> uh, you know, a page like this came from the text. Me and Andrea would talk through what we wanted to see. I would quickly draw it super quick. And then it would be a black and white page like this. This is a final drawing. This is That's what I would print at um, Staples minus the text. And then I would bring it home and add the color after Andrea kind of said, you know, yes, this is where we want the text and that's the text that you should have. So this is it after you add color. Uh, and then Andrea would get some edits back from uh, an editor at the publisher or something. And we would have to cut up the color version and rearrange it. And um, this happened so many times, um, but this is actually a collage that Andrea made because I sent her some color versions and she said, well, we got to change that. So we cut it up and um, rearranged it. And then this is a final page um, that came from that collage. So if you mix everything around, you get that. And you're able to do that in Photoshop pretty easily. Um, I prefer doing everything physically, but when it comes to edits like this, you, you kind of have to you know, slap it together. Um, another example of uh, me and Andrea sort of totally working together um, and creating this really cohesive language that we could both speak. Um, I had originally um, designed the quinine page as a seed pod. Uh, Andrea got major edits for that page. And so she sent me a drawing of how we could um, change it. And then it became the final page that you see here. Uh, towards the end, um, I was still kind of running a marathon and uh, trying to finish everything. And uh, we got these major cuts, it like cut out like 10 pages or something, which on one side, very good. On the other side, I had to reimagine an entire chapter, um, which was a lot for the last few months of production. So all of a sudden I get an email from Andrea and she's like, we've done it, we've fixed it. Um, she made this collage <laughs> out of some uh, drawings that I had done, uh, sort of trying to get the idea across. And it was really great because uh, she was able to, I, I set up that visual language in a way where she was able to then say, do this. And it translated um, and it blended in with the rest of the book and it was uh, really, really great. So there is um, a level of collaboration on a project like this um, between someone who is very uh, non-fiction minded and um, someone like me who is extremely visually minded. Um, and I think that represents uh, Humboldt in a really, really great way. Um, and this became one of my favorite sequences because we work so closely together on it. Um, so that is Humboldt uh, and that was sort of my last project. Now um, I am working on some new stuff. Uh, quite recently, I did some sample pages for um, MIT. They wanted to do a project on um, San Francisco earthquake history and the information structures that change when you are, um, you know, 
recovering from a disaster. Uh, it was really interesting because we, it, I did this the first week or so of quarantine. Um, so I was seeing information structures change around us while also making comics about information structures changing, um, which I thought was really interesting, especially this one about, um, you know, an angry rich man trying to change the uh, <laughs> conversation in the media. Uh, and then it, it was it was really interesting. Uh, I really like this project, but it's currently on hold um, for financial reasons. Uh, and then, oh, that's a horrible quality image. Very sorry. Uh, but then I did another pitch for a, um, you know, a book about uh, like the historical Jesus and sort of the history of the writing of the Bible, which I thought was really interesting as well. Kind of got back to my folklore history roots. Um, but now I am uh, obsessed with bison and that's my whole life. And uh, I am hopefully, well, I am writing a project about bison. It's in the very early stages, but uh, it's been very, very exciting. And it's a very cool, um, it's very cool that I get to write books about things that I'm like, I just want to know more about because the audience that I'm um, trying to reach are people that know are not scientists, but are interested in science. It's a cool middle ground and I'm very happy to find myself in it. And that's, that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Lily, that was amazing. Um, hey, Glenco, are you gonna go first yes. and then we take questions? Okay. Yeah. Um, so I think Lily has to stop uh, sharing. Yeah. Stop share. Okay, cool. Okay. Found it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. This is a very different energy than Lillian, but um, so I'm a Glenco. Uh, and uh, I got my BFA in illustration at Parsons with Lillian. So like, it shouldn't be such a different energy. We have a very similar background. And as we get into the talk, it'll, it'll come clear how that background is very similar. We approach work in a very similar way. We just make really different end products. Um, and so, yeah, I got my BFA in illustration in 2016 from Parsons. And then I got my MFA in, um, at the Alberta University of the Arts, which is uh, in Calgary in Canada. Um, and that one was in craft, uh, speci like um, specifically textiles and fiber. Um, and so I, I consider myself a like very multimedia artist because when I was in illustration, I was doing paintings and comics, but I was also making um, stuffed animals and blankets and in my MFA I was making a lot of different kind of like printed matter for gallery installation instead of uh, like uh, books or like you know illustration normally is something you would like see in a newspaper or you know comic books or you know animation um, so I've like have a really mixed background and a really mixed like output of my works and like it's very easy it's easier for me to categorize it all as like a, a type of forgery um though i don't mean like forgery in the really good uh image i have here which is by the artist mushba who sells really really fake ids for cryptocurrency on the dark web um i mean it more in the sense of like set design for movies as a form of forgery like all the newspapers you would see like in an Avengers film or the posters in the background or a kind of forgery in that like when you're playing like a walking sim video game and you're going around and you're picking up diary entries or listening to audio logs I basically make the diary entries and audio logs and I put them in a gallery and expect you to walk around and pick them up and find them um, and so I predominantly do fiction work um, but the thing is when you're forging objects, like making fake versions of real things enough, eventually someone will ask you to make a real thing instead of a fake version of a real thing. Um, so I'm gonna like kind of chart the journey of that starting with my science fiction work um, and like how I kind of conceptualize those objects, like the process to making a fake version of something real and like the way I'm not trying to mimic 100%, though I sometimes will mimic. 
Um, so my first thing, so here's my passport slide. It's beautiful. Thank you. Um, my first, my first example are these um, catalog cards from a library that I made for this science. It was a science fiction gallery installation, um, and I don't know how I don't know how old how many of the people in the like chat or the participants are. But like, if you haven't seen a catalog card before, they look like this. They've generally got this like very specific kind of note card aesthetic with those two lines down the side and a hole punched out in the middle and then like a very specific bits of information. Um, and so I was trying to replicate, you know, I was like the basics of this, you know, you've got the, the stripes down the side and like sets of information while still making it different. Um, and obviously it's different because I silk screen printed it. So it has different colors so i'm not trying to mimic 100 percent, but it's like so that you can look at an object that looks really different from a traditional version of it and still kind of identify what it is as long as you already know what a library catalog card is um because those are pretty obsolete um and then so another version of this was for the same gallery installation i made uh funeral cards um and i made 20 of them um and so I wasn't trying to, part of the project was not to replicate 100%. It was supposed to make these things like joyful and like kind of precious objects that you, I mean, a funeral card is a precious object regardless, but there's a somber quality to it. Um, and so in the process of making it, I looked at a lot of old funeral cards. I think most people unfortunately have seen what like what a contemporary funeral card looks like. And no offense to the funeral industry, but a lot of them are kind of tacky. Um, so I was looking at older ones, uh, just because you get like for older ones from different countries from different time periods, because you just get a lot of really different visual information. And it shows like a funeral card does not have like one set look, which is like instead of mimicking the library card, which is kind of easy because they have a very set look like the difference is normally in like how the text is written on those and how much they're annotated but a funeral card has a way broader set of visuals um but they generally have like you know a picture in the center oops the picture in the center um often they'll have like a little prayer and then they'll have the information about the person who died um the one however on the right is not actually a funeral card and it is my favorite one it is a um a, an invitation to a luncheon for the funeral of the bachelorhood of this man so it's like a lunch to celebrate this guy getting married but instead um framed as a funeral um it's like not it's it's very funny to me but i i like hmm um so i was i really liked the humor of this one so when i was doing my funeral cards one of them was like also a menu for a luncheon um and because i was doing 20 i had a lot of room to play with different ways of showing like what a funeral card could be while still telling this weird story through the cards in the gallery um but like not all of my interventions are about just kind of like a copy and then like it's just kind of an interpretation of that copy. Sometimes I'm trying to interpret something in a new way, thinking about the use. So one of the other pieces I was making was uh, a transit map. Um, and I looked at a lot of transit maps for this one. Um, <laughs> I had a book of like elegant, like someone had loaned me a book that was like this thick of like transit maps and each page, like these just beautiful ones. And I studied that and studied that um to get the general look of it but i was making one vaguely based on like a science fiction new jersey so like the new jersey rail system the nj transit map was a big influence obviously and the one on the left is like the current map um the one on the right is an older a pr promoted i don't know i didn't get a lot of information i just knew this was an old nj transit map though um but when i'm interpreting this for a fiction i'm i'm thinking about like what what makes an object like this authentic like what happens when you have a transit map like if you're carrying it around it's gonna get folds in it so i like ironed in folds and i printed it on cloth instead of paper because if you're carrying a map around and you're thinking about like how can i preserve this object like paper tears over time but a cloth will will stay like good it won't rip as easily 
Um, and so it's like not just about mimicking visuals to make it kind of recognizably a transit map, but also like how does an object age over time? How can you fake an authentic object by giving it wear and tear? Um, and sometimes like some of that can just come from the process of making it. Like, so these are printed with a kind of out of date old fashioned print technique called cyanotype printing, which is basically you lay a stencil on something and then the sun's light burns the like, the ink in and anywhere the stencil was doesn't you can just wash the ink right out so then you're left with um, traditionally blue. Um, it is what how you make a blueprint um, and then I would interfered with it some more to turn that blue ink black, um, but it gives a really uneven look to the print, um, which just gives it like wear and tear to our eyes like when you see something it just looks weathered to you to yourself. Um, so that's that one. And then like the most extreme intervention that is like probably taking it away from the original the most uh, was I did two movie posters. Um, I was looking again at retro movie posters for inspiration and pinups because um, they just have really, I really like retro aesthetics, especially when you're working with science fiction, there's just something about like retro futurism that kind of like clicks with people like the Jetsons <laughs> aesthetic is kind of what you think about a lot of the time when you're thinking about science fiction you think about like turn of the century science fiction um so that like aesthetic itself it, it, like it can make the like jumps a little easier just because we already kind of associate this stuff with the future despite it being something really solidly from the past um but then I'm thinking like you know when you have a poster like this it's not printed very like it's printed on paper not meant to last like a movie poster is only meant to be up while the movie is playing or promoting the movie and a pinup like a centerfold pinup that's in a magazine it's like yes yeah, someone might value these things a lot but they're not made to last and so when I was going to work on making uh some like fake sci-fi posters and pinups it was like what kind of materials last and so these became like big weavings um in chenille silk uh which is like kind of velvety it's a really it can be very it's a kind of tacky material um but like you know we put a lot of emotional value into these throwaway objects and it was like what if we treat these throwaway objects as something that deserves material that has value to us to match the emotional value um, and so that's like the range this can take. It can be a really like the funeral cards and the catalog cards are still just print on paper and I'm trying to mimic an object with like maybe more love like design love into it that like matches historical levels of design and a care and attention brought to those objects. Um, and also like modern objects that we disregard but like are still really important to us and giving them the attention then and kind of elevating them by making like them having like good design and uh, good material. Um, but I do, I have done things closer to like what Lily does, which is, <laughs> this is from, we both were doing this project for MIT that was, uh, had, doesn't have the funding um her book was about earthquakes mine was about and I, I, mine was about ionospheric research stations in northern canada and the failure of canadian cold war cold war technology um which sounds it's way less exciting to hear at first than earthquakes <laughs> um but because it was in a comic format, I, I was doing something much closer to Lillian's research into material and like how things would have been made at the time. Um, so for these pages, like the, the graphs in here are all the different types of ways ionospheric graphs were being uh, made. Um, and so I had to like research all the, the graphs and mimic the styles of them and like just mimicking kind of like employee sheets and trying to find photos of ionospheric measuring systems from like the middle mid-century which is really hard to do because most people don't care about mid-century ionospheric measuring stations <laughs> um 
But yeah, this was also funny to be working on because mine was about uh, being isolated in northern Canada and feeling psychological damage from not being able to see anyone else uh, at the start of quarantine. So <laughs> just a strange project all around. Um, but this is where it starts to be like leaving science fiction, right? This was a fiction, this was a nonfiction project for a pitch for a nonfiction graphic novel after having done all these like fake science fiction objects. Um, which bring, oh, sorry, I forgot. So one of the other things that I was doing to mimic it is the lettering in that comic is a really specific type of lettering called Leroy lettering, um, which if you, like whenever you look at an old graph, you'll notice the text all looks really, really similar. And it's made using this weird stencil uh, with like an inkwell in it. Um, like any like old blueprints old uh old graphs and if you just look at an old textbook you'll see this specific font and this is the painstaking way it is lettered one letter at a time um on a ruler um so i was i was using that for that project to kind of mimic an authentic uh way of writing from the time um now i can talk about the lab book um which some of you may have seen before. Um, but let me start off with saying I did my usual first step, which is study real lab books and they're not pretty. <laughs> it's like, I couldn't even do my usual treat cheat of looking up like retro lab books to find like a beautiful vintage one or a retro one because they're not pretty either. Um, they're really just they look like what they look like, bare bones, basic. They do what they're supposed to do, but they're not like great design. Um, and so my next step was I looked at um, children's worksheets, not because like, I don't think these are cleanly designed either. And I think they have a lot of problems, but there is a purpose of a children's worksheet is to convey information really clearly um and give you lots of room to work so it's like easy directions to read lots of visuals or space to work um and i thought like compared to like oops uh the just dense text of a of a a, a lab manual it was a little bit better to look at but it still wasn't giving me much to go off i liked some of the like oh my god some of the basic basic covers even though they're like still they still have a very specific look to them that is like mm, not great but like there's something to them so when i was approaching the lab manual the lab book i i wanted to like interpret reinterpret the old design so that it would be something like you're gonna have to you know so anyone who's doing the labs has this lab book with them all semester and so by necessity, you have to care about this object a fair amount just because it's for your class and you're going to be using it frequently. Um, and so I wanted to make something that like was a little less burdensome to have. Um, and so it was like, you know, on a simple level, like elevating the design to be something more pleasing just to look at. And that's like, you know, that just feels good. It's not really, <laughs> it's not like, the most necessary thing um but that that doesn't like mean there aren't concerns in designing the stuff about like what will make your life better um so like keeping the the spiral brown edge makes a lot of sense because you don't want to be flipping like if you've got your like a traditional bound book will flip shut on you and you're doing a lab you don't want your book flipping shut on you you need it to stay open to the page you're on um, and you can also, it's easier to flip around to lean on so you can write in it while you're holding it and not need to put it on a surface. Um, and then like you think about design, like how can you like really quickly glance at the page to see what you're doing? Um, so making sure like each lab had a big heading so that you could find the lab you're looking for and giving like really clear headers so you can just glance and see and giving good spacing in between each direction so you can like keep track a little bit easier on what step you're on just to like make your life a little bit easier <laughs> when you're actually doing the lab um and then so when i'm like designing some of the sheets that you have to like put information into um you know i'm trying to like simplify it fit it into a single page which can like 
be challenging on a page like this that has a lot of information and a lot of like tables and instructions on it. And and some like times you have to sacrifice like nice spacing for convenience. So like this cover class uh, chart, it's like it takes up like it would be nice not to have it there visually. However, if it wasn't there, you would have to flip back to earlier in the lab book to keep checking the cover class chart. And so like when it comes to usability versus visuals, like usability is king. Like it should be more usable for the for you. Um, but like also then sometimes some of the like quote unquote improvements visually, like they're partially visual. I think like a table with open edges just looks nicer, which like, you know, maybe in 10 years that'll fall out of like aesthetic fashion. Um, but also I personally hate when I am filling out a chart and there's not quite enough space and there's no reason for the edges to be all board boxed in. Like why can't I write kind of coming out of the box? So like sometimes it's just a personal preference. Um, but also it's like, you know, you just, you just kind of want things to look nice because it's a little easier it's superficial, but it's easier to care when something has a visual weight because you also feel like the person who is designing the book cares and like that care can be kind of infectious like care being put into an object can be transferred to the person using the object. And that's like what I wanted this lab book to feel like. And then broadly, um, it's got, you know, this green ink, which is a part of the printing process, which is like a really large part of the design of this book. Um, so it was printed using something called a risograph, which just looks like a photocopy machine, but doesn't work like a photocopy machine. <laughs> um, it kind of works like a photocopy, it's like a fancy photocopy machine. Um, but essentially like an old one, you can scan something like on a photocopier. And then there's this drum in the middle that makes basically like a stamp of whatever you've scanned in and then like prints it to scan on to it but because of this format you can only print one color at a time so you have like always like a really limited color palette really similar to like if you're familiar with screen printing you know each color goes on one at a time and you can layer those colors but it's it does limit how it, it fundamentally limits how an object is going to look once it's printed this way um but uh the printer we have you use has like a ton of colors like normally a printer will have about this many colors and the printer we had <laughs> has this many colors um and ours are printed in the light teal it's just one color including the cover um even though you would think the cover was a separate color but the inks are transparent um so when you layer them on something else they take on another they, they will add the colors together to make a new color mix um but the printing generally looks like this um this is a two color print um including like this this is just the like that blue over brown paper makes that darker kind of gray blue um and you can see like you kind of see the mix of the yellow and the blue and like these are the same blue it's just like you know, on an old newspaper comic, if you look closely, you see all the dots. It's basically printing like fewer dots to make the lighter blue. Um, and so it like, it gives it a really specific look, but it also can fabricate like a more, like the look of an older object. I think like, when you think about the, it's printed on cream colored paper and you think like paper aging over time and those inks becoming like softer, it's softer on the eyes. It's a little bit easier to look at but it also just like gives it this false sense of like a retro object that you might have like a nostalgic affection for. Um, so it's partially just like falsifying these connections to objects, but like making them feel real. That's like coming back to the forgery, it's like faking connections to objects, but like those connections then through that false like initial connection um, can become quite real. Oh, and the other reason we used risograph printing is it's much more environmentally friendly. And this is an ecology lab book. Uh, the inks are like bamboo based and the machines use very little electricity. Um, so there's, it's, it's really a good way of printing. There just aren't very many risograph printers and they're mostly being used by artists or like the occasional office that has a risograph printer. Um, so yeah, thank you. 
All right, thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, you don't have to share your screen anymore. Uh, if people have questions, they can either uh, turn on their microphone and ask their questions directly or if you are shy you can always type questions in the chat box um, i just want to point out that uh, lillian is in new york state <laughs> up in hudson right yes. and, and the glencoe is local so she's uh sitting here in south jersey both enjoying their pandemic this morning <laughs> So does anyone have any questions they want to ask? Well, people are thinking of their questions. Um, you've both talked about the processes being quite involved processes. And is there a particular part of that that you really like? I guess not. <laughs> I like all of it. Just uh, finding my favorite part is um, kind of hard. I like that day to day, the problem is not the same. You're always drawing something, but you're always solving a different sort of challenge. Like every page, every little bit of a story has to be represented in its own specific way um, to you know get the point across in the most efficient way. So it's a very active um, thing to do. It, it's like brain gymnastics constantly, which can be super tiring. And I definitely suffer from burnout a lot of the time, um, but you, it, it's really nice to sort of figure out new ways to kind of tell old stories. Solving puzzles. Yes, big into that. I really like like, the the aspect too i think like this is probably something you would have to do too lillian but like i love like finding like obsolete like techniques for making art and using them again i think like a lot of that knowledge gets lost and forgotten and kind of digging that stuff up again it brings me a lot of pleasure and learning how to use something that like has a lot of value but has just been forgotten due to like more accessible technologies um and might even like have like be worth bringing back uh like um so like the cyanotype printing is one example of that and the Leroy lettering though painstaking and I don't think that we need to do that um <laughs> I quite enjoy doing it like I like finding that stuff and working with it in, in the chat uh, Mika has a question for Lillian uh what made you get into illustration um well, uh, okay, quite honestly, when I was in middle school and high school, I, I, I was raised by artists. My mom is an art teacher. So I always knew that I was going to do art, big general art. Um, I was convinced I was going to do fashion design because I, um, at a very early age, uh, started interning at a uh, theater and becoming eventually the costume master of that theater. Um, like at age 15 or something, uh, which I don't think is legal, but it was great. Um, I later figured out that I didn't actually like sewing or anything like that. Um, and I didn't really like the fashion industry. So I uh, kind of figured out I like character, character design, figuring out um, ways to tell stories through visual medium and um, then, you know, it was illustration. That is illustration. So uh, that's what brought me there. Um, yes. Hey, Glenco, did you want to follow up on that? Um, it was an accident. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think Linda has a question. Yeah, yeah, as <laughs> a lot of our careers are. But uh, <laughs> so I, I guess a um, couple questions like, marketing how do you do you market like especially the lab books um and also some of maybe the comics or whatever into science because there's a science mix here and an artistic mix and a lot of us that are so focused on science um you know I find myself like starting to read comic books a couple of years ago because I do like that but I I have to push myself into it so but that could help with the creativity part of a person science-minded, you know, in the classroom. 
And so I'm looking at these as maybe something to be incorporated in the classroom. Um, also, maybe the lab books as you for an entrepreneur to go to smaller colleges or schools and maybe see an in for doing the lab manuals away from these big manufacturers, that, you know, these big publisher companies. So, you know, have you looked at marketing that way? And I see it as, yeah, this could be something we could incorporate into our classrooms. One, to help the students that maybe aren't real strong with science, but they are with, you know, the artistic part and that would maybe turn them into help them with, you know, learning some of those things. And then also the person who needs that creativity yeah. to help them think, you know, have you thought about doing that? You know, so if you understand my question. <laughs> yeah. Marketing is like a strange question. I like, I know very clearly how to market to publishers and like other illustrators in the creative field. It's a little like, there's like very clear ways of knowing to do it. It's like you email art directors and you give them a portfolio or you show them what you're doing. When it comes to like marketing to people without art directors, it becomes much more complicated. We're not really trained to do that. And so that's where like for the lab book, I like don't even, <laughs> this is bad. I don't consider that my marketing job. I consider that. <laughs> I consider that Dr. Glenn's <laughs> marketing job. Um, but on the other hand, like for as for like incorporating it and like bringing this to people like, you know, comics and science, um, there are like some people who are doing really interesting stuff with this. The illustrators, um, Linda Berry and Nick Susanis, they have classes, they like have multidisciplinary programs where they have science majors taking comic making classes with no like artistic experience and are just kind of like, you know, if you need to learn to draw like stick figures to learn to draw comics, like it helps a lot as a way of kind of like, like breaking through and finding new ways of thinking that can be really, really productive. Um, and also I think like, so I think like in, in incorporating it where you can find it, you know, cause there are a lot of science comics already out there and that are really really good resources like uh Lauren Redness who Lillian was talking about too is a really good source of books um but uh yeah it's like it's kind of I, I don't I don't know how to market it too <laughs> uh I, yeah I mean off of that I feel that especially in publishing you know the creators of the product do so much to create the product. Um, it really is sort of team effort. There are there's specific marketing people at the publisher um, to handle that because quite honestly, a lot of our, us creators are introverts and um, not great at it. Uh, it it's, a, it's a complicated question. I mean, personally, I love sharing the idea and I love that my work shares the idea that anyone can be interested in science and um, you don't necessarily need a degree. You don't need um, to be amazing at math. Like all these things that sort of, uh, honestly, I, I've always been very interested in researching history and science, and things of this nature, but because I have trouble with certain skills uh, like math and uh, just general organizational things. Um, I've always been kind of pushed towards the arts because it, it's more lax that way. And um, I, I feel a little less gate kept um, from that information. So me being able to, through art, kind of share that information in a, in a different way um, to people like me who want to know more and want to experience these things, but um, don't necessarily feel that they can pick up a large nonfiction book and read it all the way through. Um, you know, that, that makes me feel very happy because this information is interesting and important. Um, and so, when sort of marketing these things, it, you have to think about, you know, is the audience people who are already interested in this or is the audience people who you, who didn't know that they could be interested in this? Um, and I think that's what comics really opens up. Um, I also, I grabbed uh, Unflattening, which is uh, Nick Susanis's, uh, he did uh, his dissertation at Columbia's teaching college. Um, he was the first, um, graduate to do it in comics form. 
uh, and it's really amazing and intricate and gorgeous. Um, and me and Ag Aglenko were actually uh, his students at the time of him finishing this. Um, and uh, it, it's just, it's always been uh, a real, it, I mean, it's, it's definitely within the um, kind of section of our work, you know, it's, it's within, it's a very new weird section of publishing. Um, and this is definitely one of like the core things that kind of um, pushed, uh, you know, uh, comics into academia, which I think is really cool. Um, I also have uh, Lauren, Lauren Rennes' Thunder and Lightning, um, which is amazing just to get a sense of her work. Um, she has really gorgeous, just full art pages. It's like part fine art, part just complete book. Um, and she has a lot more text than um, I usually do. Um, and these really gorgeous pages. Um, so it does read uh, like a word book, um, but you're drawn through by the text shapes and you're drawn through by um, a lot of pages to rest and um, sort of get visual information as well. Um, I, the way that I read Lauren Redness is a lot like how I read eyewitness books. Um, I don't know if everyone grew up with these, but these were sort of my gateway into knowing that I really liked science and history. Um, they're, I, the way that they're laid out, you have your image and you have your text about the image right next to it. Um, it's super simple. It's really easy for someone who may or may not have an attention situation going on. Um, like, if you want to know about this old TV, you read about the text next to the old TV. You're not beholden to reading the thing from cover to cover. You can bounce around. You can learn about what you want to learn about. You can focus in on your interests. Um, and I think that's really um, important, especially with a younger audience. So I'm not sure if I answered your question. No, that was great. Thanks. I appreciate it. And because I find myself, like, like I said, I wanted to I love looking at the comics, the artistic part, but I find myself that I have to stop and say, okay, look at the picture because I am the one who reads opposite, like that reads all the words because that's what, you know, I grew up with and, and am used to. But um, yeah, thanks for the reference to those books. Um, and like I said, I think this is a great thing to put, bring into the classroom because we do have a lot of students who are different. I mean, I see it just from even the age of both of my children, one reads all the time like I do, the other one is more you know, visual because he's more arts. And so that's something that kind of opened my eye up to it a little bit too. But yeah, that's great, I appreciate it, thanks. Uh, we got a little comments in here in the chat from uh, Kristen. I don't know if you wanna say it, Kristen, or do you want me to read it out? Here I am. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Great to see you. Thank you so, so much. Um, I am, geez, what am I? I wear a lot of hats. I'm predominantly now um, a career advisor for the college. I do that. I do that mainly. I'm also an educator. I teach and I'm also a writer and I have a background in the arts. So my passion is for students who come, who are at a point in their academic career where they're fi finding out that they're not on this clear cut path. They've, I re just spoke to a student yesterday who's dropped out of the nursing program twice and he's a videographer. Um, a health sciences student who loves to draw. So I'm having these fantastic conversations and I'm thanking you because um, I'm going to get permission or somehow figure out how to get these students to see your presentation um, and giving them, it helps me because it <laughs> give them the confidence to take that leap. You know, how many times do you need to go back into the nursing program, a health science? You think medical is the transitional route, tra uh, the route, the path, but it's not always clear cut. Not all of us, myself included, 
have made it from point A to point B in this straight line. My line is so wiggly and squiggly and all over the place that it's so helpful to be able to talk to students and say, it really is okay to take this leap. There really is um, a f something for you out there, whether you're incorporating video into your healthcare background or you're drawing or you're illustrating or music or whatever it is, there really is a place for you. It's just not something that you could point to and say, yes, when I graduate, I'm going to go work in a hospital or yes, when I graduate. And that's all beautiful and wonderful, but I'm speaking to my, that specific percentage of students. And I just wanted to say thank you. So thank you. <laughs> I think it's like really exciting right now. I think there's a lot more like room for multidisciplinary careers and people are being advised in those. And like my own background is I also started as a fashion major like Lillian, switched to illustration, um, then was gonna become a toy designer, uh, then went into craft and did gallery installation work. And now I'm like writing a novel um, and like beyond and like through all of that, I read a lot of like philosophical theory <laughs> as a basis for everything. And like it all like you can just kind of like synthesize all of that stuff. And I'm a printmaker too. Like the more I think about it, the more it comes together. And it like I think it's really exciting. I think yeah, that students have like exciting futures, even if it's like sometimes it like it feels it sucks not to be able to just be like I'm gonna be a doctor. But like right. you have really exciting like futures in those kind of wiggly paths. I think so too, so thank you. I also just wanna note, um, it's really important to sort of say these things uh, because a lot of people that want to pursue art need to hear it. Um, it's okay also, uh, you know, illustration is not and never has been my only job. Um, I have worked in hotels, I have been a waitress, I uh, almost got my real estate license, uh, all these things um, to, you know, it, it, we need money, we need to make it work. Luckily now I am able to live off of my illustration um, money, but it took a long time and everything takes a long time. Um, and you gotta do what you gotta do. Um, so don't feel frustrated if you are um, working in the service industry or retail, um, it, it's just part of getting there, funding what you're actually wanting to do, whatever that is. I think we have time for Kira's question. Um, I cut since that follows up on that. She asked in the chat, how has networking influenced your projects that incorporate science? Uh, I, I guess I'll take this one. Um, yeah, so through Andrea Wolf, um, who is strictly a nonfiction author, um, I was able to connect with scientists from all different disciplines. And what I learned and what has informed my work now is that scientists like to talk about what they study. And I think that's so cool um, because you can just ask them whatever questions you have and they'll answer it in great detail because they're really excited to talk about it. Um, so uh, it, it, it's everything, you know, you, you have to be networking with other artists, with art directors and people in your field to get jobs. But in order to complete these jobs that involve science, you have to be networking with people outside of your little art bubble. And um, honestly, the most fascinating people I've ever met, um, the people who know the coolest stuff. Um, it, it really makes me feel like I can write and illustrate about anything because I can utilize this whole big world of scientists who just wanna talk about their stuff. Yeah, part of my, I mean, Lillian, you're part of my network. <laughs> you got me that MIT job. <laughs> um, but like part of it, I mean, like a lot of it comes from like, uh, like not just as a marketing standpoint, but as like a like uh, standpoint in like the work you're kind of doing, like the more people you meet and the more like research they're doing, the more like it expands your understanding of what is possible. So like, you know, I've, I've made friends with like people like artists who are doing very, very different stuff. Like I have people who do glass blowing and ceramics and who are reading like really different theory than I am. And like that all expands like how you think about your own work and what you're gonna do and what you're trying to do with your own work just because you're influenced by them. Um, and like, you know, you can kind of see it like uh, people used to joke that like long ago, Lillian and I's artwork looked identical. <laughs> um, 
and it's just like you you know you you look at the same references as the people around you just because they're passionate about that stuff um and like you know you meet more people and you look at the other things that those people are also passionate about um and it just kind of like changes your trajectory just like a little bit but in like a really pleasant way like you're just kind of like always there's always more to learn and there's always more people to meet and as you meet those different people like different opportunities come up you make like good friendships and you learn a lot of stuff you wouldn't normally learn otherwise okay i think we have uh used up our time and i really appreciate you guys coming and and talking to us um i'm going to uh make a, a YouTube link out of this video. And uh, if anybody wants it, uh, you can email me. But if they want to get in touch with either of you, is there a way that uh, they can reach you? Uh, my email is on my website, lillianmelcher.com, just my name.com. Um, you can reach me there anytime. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Um my uh i'm basically findable anywhere on the web under the username a a glenco which is a g l e n n c o uh you can email me my emails on my website which is a glenco.com or you can like dm me on twitter or instagram or whatever yeah, I'm, I'm pretty easy to find <laughs> i'm also on instagram i don't post much but i'm always on it so <laughs> in case anyone's trying to reach you right <laughs> Okay. Um, well, I appreciate it. It was uh, different from our other ones because mm -hmm. of the bringing in the art. So I really am glad you guys came and, uh, and I hope everybody has a safe and uh, a safe Thanksgiving and eat a lot of delicious food. Kristen, did you want to say something? You too. Thanks. Thank you. No, just thank you. Bye. Thank oh, you. that was a wave. That was a wave. Okay. I can't tell. I'm so I'm... excited. I keep pressing things. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you.